Romans chapter 12 at verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. And we pray. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. What follows in this first section, 9 through 13, looks like it's just random exhortations. It's called a paranesis. It's a structure that was common in that day. And it's all dealing with love, with genuine love. The word for love there is our old friend agape. And it does not mean, as has been commonly said, God's love. It means unconditional, sold out love. God's love is always unconditional, always sold out. But not all love, not all agape is from God. Uh, in one place in scripture we're told that uh, you love your bellies and the word there is agape and that has nothing to do with God. It's meant as a condemnation. So um, Paul is writing to a church he does not know to introduce himself. And so he addresses in this part uh, the idea of love in such a way that the, the pagans, the Romans, the Greek speaking can follow and recognize that he's educated. But uh, verses 9 through 13 are one verse, are one sentence in the original. And that by far is not his record for run on, but it does indicate that all this is connected. It, it is not as unconnected as it may appear on the surface in English. And so um, the framework of all of this has to do with sold out unconditional love. This first section 9 through 13 seems like it's addressed primarily to our fellow believers or at least as it starts out to fellow believers and it shifts especially at verse 14, uh, to a relationship in general. I'll say more at verse 14 and following. But, but the whole thing has to do with how we Christians behave, especially in love. And again, as 1 Corinthians 13 would tell us, love is not an emotion, it's not a feeling, it is a behavior. It is how you treat someone else. Uh, let love be without hypocrisy. Let it be without pretense is another way of looking at that. Let it be genuine. Um, what we do in our relationships with each other, uh, hypocrisy gives this idea that it may be a mask. In those days, one actor on stage would play many roles and every time they would change roles, uh, they would put on a different mask. Uh, today you might think of a ventriloquist who has two or three or four different dummies and every time he changes dummies he changes voices and persona. And uh, that's the image Paul is using. Uh, let it be without a mask, without any sense of putting on anything. Abhor or dislike what is evil. Um, in a few minutes, we'll read, uh, we're not supposed to curse those who persecute us. But here, we're told that evil is to be disliked. And it goes back to what's been commonly said, that you can love the sinner, but what? Hate the sin. Uh, and, and so in, in these verses, we're supposed to dislike what is evil. That is a behavior. Um, it may be more than a behavior, but it is no less than a behavior. Uh, but it's not a human. It's not a person. Abhor what is evil.
clean. Now the word there means to glue. And so we're supposed to glue together that which is good, stuck like glue. In honor, giving preference to one another. Now, you hear the word countercultural tossed out a lot today. Yes? That is the most countercultural thing you'll hear of today. They, in that society, in that day, thought it was good that you uh, give preference to yourself, that you build yourself up, that you raise yourself up. And so Paul gives what is extremely countercultural to the general society of that day. And again, he's addressing fellow believers about treatment to fellow believers. This is not meant to be necessarily how I'm supposed to treat someone outside the body of Christ, but especially inside the body of Christ, especially in a congregation where you're living together I'm supposed to give honor, preference to everybody else. Now what would that look like in a congregation if everybody gave preference to somebody else? There would be very little in the way of disagreement. Um, even if it's deserved, the people most deserving would go about giving preference to another. You're going to see this here in just a second in a slightly different way. But what that would look like is, you know, if, if the church had a janitor, the janitor might be the one that's treated the best in the congregation. Because everybody else in the supposed hierarchy would be treating the janitor like he was the top person in the, in the church, or whoever in theory would be the lowest, in honor. And so I would honor others by giving preference to anyone but me inside the congregation. Uh, not lagging in diligence, don't being sluggish, fervent in spirit, Serving the Lord, now that's specifically the Lord Christ. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, con continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints. That's how we know that this is addressed to uh, those inside the body of Christ. Distributing to the needs of saints, given to hospitality. All right, that comes off as a list of disjointed rules. How will it look in the Greek? I'm going to show it on the screen, hopefully. All right. Is that better? Each line is a different thought. Think of it as being like a different line in one poem. It's called a paranesis, but line one, in brotherly love, being devoted to one another, in honor, outdoing one another, in zeal, never flagging, in the spirit, being a glow. To the Lord, serving, in hope, rejoicing, in tribulation, being patient, in prayer, being constant, to the needs of the saints, sharing generously, to strangers, being diligent. That gives an idea of what's being communicated in the Greek. It's, it's not a poem, but it has a specific f format. And it starts and ends with homophones. 
words that sound alike, and that's the bookend. The homophones. Um, in brotherly love, what's the word for brotherly love? Brotherly love. We've got a city named brotherly love. The city of brother. Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the starting and the end in hospitality, I said, to strangers. And that's the word, that's the other word. I'm rusty on this. Philoxemia. Philoxemia. To strangers being diligent in hospitality. All right. It's like a poem, a free verse poem, but it's got a very clear structure, and it's done like this to lend weight to this church that doesn't know Paul but can recognize Paul's intelligence in presenting it this way. Now, in brotherly love, all right, that's the love between siblings, right? Yes, no, maybe, brotherly love. But isn't that what it means, brotherly? Brothers and sisters. Well. In, in, a, in a larger sense in Christ. But, but it's, let me make my point. In brotherly love, that is love between siblings, and then by expansion, siblings in Christ. Being devoted, the devoted is parental. In the Greek, it's the care a parent gives a child. So, in, in, with my siblings, again, in Christ now because it's to Christians, but the wording is not theological, it's not religious, the wording is secular. He's using secular words to describe a, 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 a Christian expression, but how am I devoted to one another? Like a parent to a child, or as an older brother, sister, to a younger brother, sister. Anybody been in that position where you were the one, you know, you hear these stories of families with large numbers of kids where the older sibling gets stuck as a mini parent. All right, this is, this is what that's talking about. This is the church where we're devoted to one another, yes, but like a parent to a child in honor outdoing one another. I already mentioned how countercultural that is. In zeal, never flagging. That's not talking about zeal in general. Have you ever met someone that's happy all the time? Is it just me or do you want to strangle that person sometimes? Just, I mean, it's just too happy all the time. This is not talking about that kind of zeal. It's talking about as an expression of love. As I live out love in my community, my zeal for that love is never to get old. It's to never flag. It's um, just this past week was the birthday of William Wilberforce, who was chief opponent to slavery in Great Britain. And uh, the last letter Mr. Wesley wrote was to Wilberforce. Uh, where he quotes the line, never be weary in well-doing. And that's the kind of zeal that Paul is talking about here. Don't, don't, don't get tired. Just, just like we're supposed to dislike what is evil, behavior, spirits, we're supposed to just keep going. And there's this element of persistence in the spirit, being a glow is the translation giving here, but the being a glow literally means boiling or bubbling. What's the image there? 
boiling. It's a pot on a stove, isn't it? A friend of mine that got old and finally retired, and that says something because I've got friends that are still pastoring in their 90s. A friend of mine got to the place that they were no longer able to pastor, and his expression was, well, I'm on the back burning burner, but I'm still bubbling for Jesus. That's the kind of expression that's given there. To the Lord serving. Now, there is a, a minor manuscript that will say something different to the Lord, but the vast majority of the ancient manuscripts say it's to the Lord that we serve. What does that mean? That for a Christian, everything you do, you do as unto the Lord. You, 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 you serve how you serve because ultimately Jesus is who you're serving. You know, um, this is in all of our relationships, but especially those in the church. In hope, rejoice. You notice how he gives the situation in hope, and then he gives this action, rejoicing. Well, hope is for something you don't have. You don't hope for what you've already got. Paul makes that argument elsewhere, so does uh, you know other uh, books. You hope for what you want to get. But here it's saying, in hope rejoicing, uh, it's sort of a not yet already situation. In tribulation, being patient, those two things seem to hook together. In hope rejoicing, in tribulation, patience. I mean, if the best you can do is not joy, at least keep going. At least be patient. For me, the ultimate reality expressed here is the resurrection. What is my ultimate joy? What is my ultimate hope? That I spend eternity with God and the people of God. And so that's my, that's my ultimate hope. And to that end, I can rejoice. And if in my living for Christ, there is persecution, since they hated him, Christ said in this world, you know, you will be hated. Uh, since they hated him and because of him hate us, there is gonna be persecution. Well, just keep going, be patient. Um, he, he gives, it's actually an echo of what he's already said in Romans 5, and three following. We also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. And so he's putting into this structure something he's already told us but he repeats it because of how important it is. In prayer, being constant. That's the energy behind all of this. Um, a couple of months ago, the Methodist men had a speaker. And Charles told us that prayer is work. What was the second line? Does anybody remember? Prayer is work but prayer works. We have to invest in the energy of prayer to the needs of the saints, sharing generously. That sharing is uh, the same basic word as the people of God or the church, koinonia the called out ones. And uh, so we're to invest with the called out ones, the, the saints, sharing generously. 
And Paul in a few verses is going to raise the idea of needing to take an offering for missions. And so he concludes that section that uh, given to hospitality, and specifically there, the hospitality is because of that homophone we know is to, uh, to strangers. All right. Certainly. more to come. That's our calling. We, we shift gears to relationships in general. Bless those who persecute you. Now again, we're supposed to dislike evil, but the people who do it, we're supposed to bless. Do not curse. I'm going to give you, I'm going to just go ahead and, and jump to the end on this. And, and from 14 to 21 is spiritual warfare. I'm going to just go ahead and give you the punchline. 14 to 21, all of that is spiritual warfare. Now, when you typically think of spiritual warfare, you think of Ephesians 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, rulers of this dark world. I'm going to pretend like I've read all of those verses. We will. But let me point out why it's spiritual warfare. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Check the idea that bless is said twice, not once, twice. Bless, even if they persecute you, bless. 17, repay no one evil for evil. All right, is that because we're wimpy and give in? No. Well. Here, here on uh, 19, that was 17, repay no one evil for evil. Beloved, do not avenge yourself. It is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So ultimately, what we're saying there is, if you give in to vengeance on the earthly plane, you're taking God's place. You're taking what belongs to God. And who is going to repay? God. All right, verse 21. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. That's spiritual warfare. How are we supposed to overcome evil? If if we if we use the tools of the devil, how are we different from the devil? You remember the time Jesus was accused of uh, being used of the devil? He cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus, in response, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now Abraham Lincoln used that for the Civil War. But the principle is you can't cast out evil with evil. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. changed that slightly to say that you can't overcome hatred with hatred. You can only overcome hatred with love. And so it's actually a method of spiritual warfare where you're trusting God and allowing God to use you an instrument where he shows the kingdom of God in your behavior and 
you trust God to be the one who brings everything out to being right. Now one of the things that means is that you trust God's judgments more than you trust your own. The first time I ever felt like I was having a nervous breakdown, I sought the counsel of another pastor and told him the issue that was going on in the church where I felt like my people were being attacked by the bishop. And uh, he said in response, and I believe it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he said, A, they're not your people, they're God's people. God already knows what's going on. He said, B, your problem is unforgiveness. <laughs> I wanted to hit him. But you know, the second I took his counsel, God dealt with that situation very mightily. And I think one of the side effects was it taught me that I can't judge right from wrong in those situations and I can't be the one to try to correct them. I can only be the instrument of God's kingdom and I do it in God's manner. That's the only way that works for a Christian. If I take the tools of the devil, I only end up like the devil. That's not my goal. All right, bless those, backing up to verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Not because you're a wimp, but because you know your older brother, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, is stronger than any power on earth. Rejoice with those rejoice who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. By the way, my, my opinion on 15 is it's a whole lot easier to weep with those who weep than it is to rejoice with those who rejoice. We do a pretty good job in the church with weeping with those who weep, but just to celebrate someone else, it goes back to that whole idea I was talking about earlier that you give preference to one another. It's so very countercultural. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind or be of one mind toward one another. In other words, everyone that is in the body of Christ is to have the same way of thinking, the same nature of thinking. It's a repeat of what he says in Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. It's the mind of Christ. It's not all of y'all follow me. It's not me follow you. It's all of us have the mind of Christ. It's one mind. It's not divided. Do not set your mind on high things. Other translations might read haughty things. In other words, don't be puffed up in your own thinking. All right. Oh, you weren't talking to me. I'm sorry. You were giving... <laughs> I was making a joke. Your translation reads conceited. All right. But notice, notice in 16, one mind set that mind on high things. Associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So you've got mind, mind, and opinion. You know something, we're not saved by what we think, but what we think really, really, really does matter. Don't be conceited. Don't set your mind on high things. Be one mind. Be of the same mind. Don't be wise in your own opinion. How many of you can remember me talking about the original sin? Don't I hit that about once a week? Garden of Eden, the original sin, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't I hit that about once a week? That's what it is to be wise in your own opinion. That's to think you know better than God does. What does that mean, self-righteous? 
Well, self-righteousness does rise from it, but it, it's, it's, it's actually being wise in my own opinion. And, and that, that does allow self-righteousness to rise, um, but it's, it's, you know, and you don't go in saying, I'm smarter than God. You just act like it. Let me, let me rephrase. I don't go in <laughs> saying I'm smarter than God. I just occasionally act like it. And that's to be wise in my own mind. I know right from wrong. No. Scripture teaches us that I'm to have the mind of Christ and that I let God decide right from wrong. And that means I have uh, humility all right, moving on, 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Again, back to this idea that by not repaying evil for evil, not only is that a, a technique or a ploy, it's actually warfare. You know, a technique is if, if uh, uh, you've watching a bunch of kids and, and uh, one kid does something to the other one and the other one wants to do it back, you know, you stop them from hitting the other kid back so that it doesn't escalate. That's not what's being said here. It's not saying don't escalate. It, it, it's saying attack evil by not repaying evil for evil. It means I don't belong to Satan. Satan, the ultimate evil one, uses those kind of tools. What kind of tools does Jesus use? Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now 18 is the closest, verse 18 is the closest you'll get to an escape clause. And the escape clause is what? if at all possible, as much as depends on you. Why? It doesn't always depend on me. I can try to live in peace. I can do my dead level best. And the other can not live at peace with me. And so I end up not at peace with someone. Not because I haven't done my part. Not because I haven't bent over backwards. But because having bent over backwards not repaying evil for evil, the other one still is at war with me. But it's not an escape clause. I said the closest thing like an escape clause. It does acknowledge that it doesn't always, but that doesn't mean the first time you run into someone who uh, won't be at peace with you, you're supposed to say, well, I did my best. It's, it's acknowledging it doesn't always depend on you. But it does say that everything I'm capable of doing, I do. And that's where really the focus should be. Live peaceably with all men. There you go. Two wrongs do not make a right. But... Sometimes it's not just two wrongs. Sometimes the other one just keeps wronging and wronging and wronging. And that can mean that I'm not at peace with someone. But it should never be, and this is the ideal, it should never be because I'm not doing my part to be part of the kingdom of God. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Quotation, Deuteronomy 32, 35, says the Lord. In other words, any kind of judgment, any kind of passing sentence, any kind of carrying out the sentence belongs to God. Strange historical fact. Clergy historically have never been allowed to be on juries in the United States. 
increasingly that's no longer the case. But historically, why? Because we're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to substitute our opinion for God's opinion. And, and the assumption is that we would actually carry out this do not avenge yourself, give, rather give place to wrath. And that would be extended not only upon us as an individual, but upon any with whom we have authority. And so increasingly that's no longer, as, as secular society becomes more and more unfamiliar with what Christianity truly is, it's no longer observed. But historically, if you identified yourself as clergy, you were never asked to be on a, a jury. And so Paul starts to conclude this section with quotation Proverbs 25, 1 and 2, uh, 21 and 22. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Now, this is not being nice. This is part of the warfare. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. How many of us want to have heaps of heaping coals of fire placed on our heads? It's an attack. How do we attack? with good. It's spiritual warfare. We, uh, we attack with doing good. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Now, I'm told confession is good for the soul. Seems like I've read that somewhere. There have been times in my life the only way I could do this is to image myself spiritually placing a coal burning on someone's head and do good to them and just in my mind think here's your coal <laughs> I'm still working on this I'm a work in progress but but the image is you know it's warfare but it's how Christians do warfare we do warfare by feeding our enemy when they're hungry giving them water when they're thirsty do not be overcome by evil. See, that's the danger. If I do it the devil's way, who is going to end up as my God? Do not be overcome by evil. Don't let the devil end up my God. Overcome evil with good. True love. What are your thoughts on that section? Or on all of it? Are we good? I feel like I've run a race. <laughs> but I usually do after I teach or preach. I just, I mean, it just is so much. All right, then let's pray. Father, your word is so very different than what we were holding before we met you. And sometimes the struggle to release what we have been holding and open ourselves to you is, is difficult. For those of us that feel like we've run a race and just hearing your word strengthen us in righteousness but give us the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Lately, every sermon that you have...